Do you ever find yourself going down a nostalgia rabbit hole? Because same, honestly. A while back, I had already went down the Bill Nye path to relive those moments in class when the TV cart would be rolled in, and it was time to learn about something scientific. But it had me remembering another reason why the TV cart would be rolled out sometimes, and that would be for none other than Reading Rainbow. Ah, it's like music to my ears. That's because it is. That perfect brain blast of connecting myself to being a kid again. Look, I say it all the time, but it's true. I love edutainment, specifically taught in a way that doesn't feel like it's information dumping, and more like you're learning under the guise of the entertainment part of the word. Plenty of live action shows and cartoons can fit this description, but one of the top dogs in the field right up there with Bill Nye is Reading Rainbow. For over 20 years, 21 seasons, and more than 150 episodes, generations of kids growing up got to experience the joy of this program, and were blessed with the knowledge of never forgetting the theme song to the show. It's like you're a sleeper soldier awakening the second you hear those first few notes played. So let's fall down a fun little rabbit hole as we look back on Reading Rainbow, just to feel something, you know? So whether you were there for it when the show was still running, or still have it played for you in school, or even unfortunately never heard of it, there's a lot of fun to be had exploring all that makes Reading Rainbow so special. But beneath the cover of the book that Reading Rainbow Rainbow is, lies a story so rich in inspiration, with an ending that didn't quite want to be finished, and a litigious attempt at a story continuing. This is the rise, fall, and almost rise again of Reading Rainbow. But you don't have to take my word for it. So the base concept of Reading Rainbow had the show split up into three segments mainly. First, we'd be introduced to the book we'd end up reading at the start. Miss Nelson is back. Is that why all these kids look so sad? I wonder where she went. Then going through it, establishing the main theme of the episode from there in relation to whatever would be read. She's a real witch. <gasps> oh! After this, we would get some sort of field trip. Hey, I've got an extra ticket here. Why don't you come join me? Bringing us somewhere or doing something that directly related to the topic from the book read. In the end, the kids would enter into a discussion regarding other books in relation that they read as well as giving them a chance to formulate their own opinions, giving them directly to you, the audience, creating a dynamic conversation that helps reach out to those watching to join in on said conversation. I'm here to tell you about a great book, Daddy is a Monster Sometimes, and it's just marvelous. The goal of the show wasn't to teach you how to read, but to help you find the love of reading, the love of general discussion, and why the medium of literature can be incredible. What made the show special wasn't just the books that were read or the adventures we would go on, but it was the formula that made it all come together and work. From the story of how Reading Rainbow came together to the magical host LeVar Burton was, that all helped define the legacy that this show would go on to have. Sure, it was a form of escapism from school itself at some points, but it was an incredible tool in keeping one medium alive and thriving in a world where other mediums were taking over more and more for the younger generation. But you can't forget, this wasn't just a classroom getaway, but a full-on show presented on PBS and eventually PBS Kids. <laughs> running for a total of 21 seasons, having over 150 episodes produced. And maybe after today, you'll see how the magical formula came together and found a way to leave a lasting 23-year-long legacy. Catch a ride with Reading Rainbow. It's a place where books come to life. Get ready to roll, because around here, it's all about the books. So picture this, we're back at the start of the 1980s, a time in which television seemed to be taking over as a medium for all ages to form an attachment to for entertainment. Because of this, more traditional forms of storytelling, like books, were starting to fall to the wayside. At least that's what the educational powers that be thought. This was mainly noticed and became a concern during the summer season where the fear was that kids were not caring about reading as much during these months since television was so captivating. And it's the summertime. Why do something with these months off from school 
school that feels like school. At least for me, how many people growing up remember being berated with the push for summer reading, or having summer reading assignments that could count for some grade points when school returns? The reason why this type of push was so prevalent was due to trying to combat the attention from the medium of television. Funny enough, it wasn't really for being against the programming itself since stories, morals, and lessons can be taught in many forms, but it was for the issues of literacy skills in general. Reading kind of forces you to get better at that. It's literally in the definition of the word literacy. Adding on to that and writing assignments during school or anything additional given throughout the summer. TV, well, it requires neither. You can watch it passively, you can watch it more attentively, but it didn't ask anything from you. You get visually given a story, you most times understand it, and you are more often entertained than not. So what are educators to do, especially during the time of these rising concerns? Simple. If you can't beat them, join them. This required PBS and their affiliated TV stations, specifically YNED TV, as well as Great Plains National and ETV, to get out what this idea could be. These stations would co-produce the show and first test it within their individual markets of Buffalo, New York and Lincoln, Nebraska. But who were the people behind the concept? It was these three people. Cicely Truett Lancet and Larry Lancet, a couple that ran Lancet Media, having a hand in working on children-focused programming, and Twyla C. Liggett, a teacher turned executive producer and overall creator of this eventual program, who saw that television would be a crucial way to reach out to kids and help get them into reading. They could create something real and relatable that could help expand the fascination of written works, doing so through a television show that can visually illustrate why it was. Thanks to the BISG, or the Book Industry Study Group, their surveys they ran from the later 70s and into the 80s proved that there was a decline in the percentage of kids and young adults that were reading books, or in general, interested in reading more. Cut to both of the Buffalo and Lincoln local stations taking notice of how the rise of television is affecting the youth, taking them away from the want to learn in general, but reading being the most affected medium because of this. But the thought occurred that this newer medium can help bring this other and now more pushed aside medium front and center once more, but you just have to be creative in how you do so. A show where a random person reads you a book in a dry and slow format would probably do more harm than good. So the director of educational services for YNED TV at the time, Tony Bettino, would start digging into this, seeking out teachers, librarians, or any sort of figure in the educational space to see how this surveyed decline was actually playing out in the classroom. Finding out that less kids are reading in the summer, hearing how teachers would spend weeks just helping the students get back up to previous reading levels that they would have been at before summer break, and seeing the increase in this struggle grow. He would then look back upon any programs from the station's past that had this factor of reading, using them as a base to try and formulate something new. While these wouldn't quite hit the exact mold they were looking for, it did help. Tony, and for that matter the station as a whole, saw that developing this idea further was a good thing but they just needed to keep cooking it up. Over on the Great Plains National and ETV front, Twyla was hired on where their initial goal was help bringing educational-based content directly to classrooms, but eventually felt that it would be great to also be involved in making the programming themselves as well. Twyla liked the idea and already had her own feelings towards the matter of reading for students. Looking at her own past as a teacher, she wanted to take how she implemented her students to read out loud in class, and this was before reading out loud or having some form of popcorn reading was a staple thing that many teachers added to their curriculum, and help find a way that gets more kids to actively participate in the experience. She wanted to help develop that style and bridge that to where the kids can retain the information learned and discuss how they perceived it with each other. And as these building blocks were happening over in Nebraska, back in Buffalo, Tony was still playing with the concept of the program, trying to see what would truly work. Then it hit him. If they had the funds to produce a show, and I mean real proper funds to do so, what would be the the exact show they would want to make. Through this research he had done, both the Buffalo Base Station and the Nebraska Base Station came together and formed a nice little partnership in the pursuit of the same goal. Twyla's plan would take the lead in developing the structure of the show and bringing back in Cicely and Larry, and Tony was a fan of previous works they had done and was excited when they were interested greatly in being a part of this new production trying to come together. This became the core team to start everything going, and thanks to earning a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, 
there was now money to start making the show a reality. Lynn Gannick was brought on board as one of the writers of the project, helping really nail down what the show can be. Taking the original concept of the series focusing on inner city kids who would find enjoyment in reading out of boredom from not being able to attend a summer camp, and thinking there was a more interesting way to deliver the idea of enjoying reading if they pivot and went a different route with it. Sitting down with Larry and Cicely and establishing the mentality of encouraging kids to find the love of reading, not teaching them simply how to read. Learn to love the narrative within the story told, not how to read a page, sound out words, or have it on such a simplified level. Ellen Schechter was another writer on the project, and as the group was fully coming together, meetings and plannings would take place as ideas would either be looked into further or shot down in an open discussion way between them. Going back to the grant, it wasn't as simple as being handed a sum of money to get the project going. As is such for public broadcasting, PBS would never pay in full the amount it would cost to produce a show. The money needed to be brought in from other places first, with PBS then coming in to cover what they can cover. The budget they needed to come together with on their own was $1.6 million, which would cover the first 15 episodes of the program. Having around half that from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, it would take another 18 months of proposals being written by Twyla before Kellogg's, yes, that Kellogg's, would put up the other half of the money to give the team enough to make the 15 episodes. But then, where does LeVar Burton fit into all of this to host the program? Blah, 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 blah. PBS Kids! PBS Kids! First, before LeVar would be brought on board, Jackie Torrance was planned to be the host, but longer discussions about this aspect led to a larger roster of people being looked at for this role. They wanted the host of the show to fit a certain list of criteria. They needed to find someone who was sincere, someone who doesn't feel like they are playing a character. They wanted someone authentic. When the group had attended a conference for children's television, they noticed none other than LeVar Burton there. The group then thought, hey, this guy is perfect. He fits exactly what this role would need. This began them all looking into why he would be perfect. They saw how he carried himself, the passion he had towards what he does, and how captivating he was when he was on screen. You simply couldn't take your eyes off him. And once they reached out to him about the show, shooting the pilot with LeVar as the host was agreed upon from both sides. For LeVar, this originally just seemed like any other gig for him to take at the time, being very early on in his career of hosting and acting, but beyond that for him, he at least had the want to do this specifically thanks to his mother, Irma Jean Burke who was an English teacher herself and instilled in him the love of literature and stories in general, helping him see them as these crucial parts of life that are important and meaningful. LeVar continued these values into his adulthood, having a passion for reading, learning, and of course, helping bring these same feelings to a younger generation that can benefit and grow from it. He thought the concept of this small public broadcast show was a great way to bring the world of reading to the television landscape, blending the two worlds together in a way that can entertain and be a vessel to learn and take something away from. Thanks to some unknown intern who was working at WNED-TV at the time, the name Reading Rainbow was born, and LeVar took the role with a sense of lightheartedness and professionalism. Clearly, thanks to his passion, he was having fun, and it never came off as something he felt forced to do for a role. And to speak to his professionalism, he would always show up to the set or location of filming, being on time, and having his lines fully memorized. When he would learn the scripts, going over them with Ellen, he wouldn't just take the words there at face value and recite them on camera. Instead, he would work with the writers and bring in what related to him personally and inject that into it. He would take stories and moments from his life to help present different moments within the show, allowing him to become a storyteller of not just the books being discussed, but the storyteller of his own life, his own experiences, making him so much more genuine when he spoke to the viewers watching. To decide on the books themselves, Lynn would head to the library and start pulling books left and right, up and down from different shelves and begin reading them, finding the perfect literature that they could work with for the show. They also had to make sure the books chosen were highly accessible to any kid at any library, so they would confirm with the National Library Association that the books chosen could be found anywhere. But then there was the cost, at first. No book was going to let the show use them for free, so the selection they had with the money they could spend towards the authors and illustrators was scarce and limited. But as things would continue on, the publicity from the show added a level of advertisement for books, so the use of some of 
of them became an easier thing to get. But to make the show dynamic to the viewer, to bring in part of the fascination, was the visual aspect, matching the theming of what they would show to the books they would discuss. If they were to discuss volcanoes, they would need to capture footage of volcanoes. This would help to hook the viewers with footage directly associated with the context of the discussion that drew you in and helped you visualize everything better. Let's move forward to now having the pilot shot and hoping that they have made the best project possible. Lynn decides to bring the pilot to a couple professors at Yale that write for a column in TV Guide. If you remember what those are, they're basically obsolete now, but they were cool, mainly because they sometimes did collectible versions of them, and that means having these cool Pokemon ones. Regardless of that side piece of info, the two Yale professors looked at the pilot, and with Lynn really looking up to these two writers, eager to hear something good, they responded with less than stellar remarks, claiming that the show wouldn't go anywhere and it was awful. Ouch. Despite this, everything still marched forward like planned. The pilot episode featuring the book Gila Monsters Meet You at the Airport didn't serve as the first official episode to the series, mainly because of two reasons. That being the word monster in the title, and someone in the production had a personal bad experience with a Gila monster when they were younger. So it just didn't premiere as the first episode, as everyone for the most part was extremely proud of and happy with how the final product turned out. On July 11th, 1983, Reading Rainbow would officially premiere on PBS with the episode Tight Times. This would lay the groundwork for what to expect in each episode of the show, giving us an intro with LeVar doing something in relation to the theme of the episode's book. Hi there! Quite a show, isn't it? Pet show. Prizes for all. Serving as a good lead into when the book is introduced. This is a book called Tight Times. And it's a story about a little boy who really hurts because he wants some things he just can't have. And having the pictures in the book be shown with added zoom ins or zoom outs and panning effects to give it some life. I hate lima beans. If I had a dog, I'd make him eat mine. Sometimes this required light animation help to extend certain images or establish certain scenes within the book that may be cut off on the actual pages themselves. This would be voice acted and narrated to emphasize the story being told as the visual aid, an audible aid sold how these words and pictures can truly be brought to life in a way that fit both mediums. Then Something sort of scary happened. Daddy started to cry. Once the book was finished, LeVar would go into the lesson or moral learned through the pages in the book and how it can relate back to the real world. So even when times are hard, a lot of great surprises can still squeeze through those tight times. This could also turn into some sort of song or activity to make the episode a bit more lively. Throw the rag, watch it fall, rag basketball. Before we'd go on a trip, like to the library here in the first episode, where it would show all the realms of media you can explore, from every form of literature with books to magazines, as well as a place that could serve you with movies and records. Free library! That's right! Come on, let's check it out! That's one thing that made the show work on a larger scale. While the main focus was books and reading, it respected the other forms of media out there without demonizing them. After this segment, we would get a series of other kids that would review other books that are somewhat related to the book read initially in the episode. The terrible thing that happened in our house by Marge Blaine. Let me tell you that this this book is very crazy. How would you like to read a book that makes you feel sad and happy at the same time? Well, I just did. This gave kids a chance to talk directly to other kids viewing, hearing recommendations right from the kids who read them. Over time, this format would be played around with as certain parts would be extended out, or LeVar would fill in less of the runtime and be used to introduce the next part of the segment, but in general, it followed a working formula that spoke to the younger generation without feeling like it was speaking down to the younger generation. An important important factor in edutainment that I personally look for that works the best for me to be entertained and to learn from. As the show grew over time, the popularity helped garner the interest in publishers wanting their books on the show, seeing how their books would then sell or just in general become something highly discussed, directly correlated with Reading Rainbow. Kids loved the show. Reading in general was up, and more specifically, the interest in reading was up. It's one thing to read because you feel like you have to or you're told to, it's another thing to want to, and this show made made kids want to read, want to take in these stories for themselves, and use the recommendations from kids in the show to rush out to the libraries or stores in order to find them. Reading Rainbow was quickly becoming a phenomenon. Those TV Guide writers just were out of touch with the vision. Things seemed great, but there was one big problem. The budget for the show wasn't a whole lot, and when I say that, I mean very, very little. The show suffered from trying to produce the best show possible. When the second season came around, the show produced less episodes. Literally a third of what the first season had because of how hard to find the budgeting for it all was. PBS did what they could, but even they saw this as a very 
scary time for children's television, with many programs unsure of their future. Twilo worked tirelessly behind the scenes to secure whatever funding they could to make more episodes, with many times being close to having the production pulled or put on hiatus. Without her, the show may have come to an end way earlier into its lifespan, and it wouldn't have gone on to be the iconic show it was blossoming into. When their initial main funders couldn't understand the flow of production in the television space, it became hard for them to be reliable with getting back to them in time for things to get done, or have the funds prepared and secured as a guarantee when they did. It was anything but a simple process. This led to other sources like Barnes & Noble, the National Science Foundation, and more to give funds out to the show for some time. But even then, these were only temporary solutions to an ongoing issue. Reading Rainbow wasn't like other educational shows, and they knew that. This wasn't a Sesame Street situation where they can toss Elmo out as a plush toy to the world and recoup funds, or earn more funds and attract other sponsors to pay for the show. This also wasn't their aim either, as the main goal was the educational aspect of it. Not to say that it's a bad thing that other educational programs like Sesame Street do that, but there was a big difference in how the brands were built. They surely looked into the avenue of venturing into merchandising, but it was hard, especially when confronted with the reality that the show is a program that showcases books, but they didn't own the books. The publishers of the books were sure eating good from the interest garnered in them from the show, but reading Rainbow's biggest benefit became maybe getting the books for free for the show sometimes, simply just not having to pay a fee to have them on the program. They did have the iconic butterfly from the intro, but even then, everyone felt like that was a cop-out and not what they wanted to do, not what they set out to do. Making the butterfly a staple character of the show just to give them an avenue for merch didn't sit quite right with anyone. Not with the creators of the show, and not with LeVar. LeVar was looked upon with a lot of love for adding the humanity to the children's TV landscape. He wasn't a puppet, he wasn't an eccentric character. He was him, and because of that, a level of connection was there when he spoke in front of the camera that felt missing from so many programs around it. And they certainly weren't going to make an action figure or doll of LeVar for the sake of having something on store shelves just to bring in the funding. All of this felt like the good nature and learning focus aspects of the show were the most important, with the morals being good both in front of and behind the scenes. Even through all the struggles, less episodes, and a very limited budget, the show prevailed on. Even when LeVar was still working in the acting field and booking a role on Star Trek The Next Generation, he still would come and shoot everything that he had to do for the show on the weekends between his weekday shoots on Star Trek. He actually almost stopped being the host when he had got the part in Next Generation, but thanks to one of the executive producers on the show, Rick Berman, he helped make sure that LeVar could still find time to film for Reading Rainbow. Having worked in children's programming in the past, and not wanting the show to lose a part of what made it so special. LeVar was crucial to why the show worked so well, and LeVar took this responsibility with as much respect for the role as he had for any other. Because of this connection to Star Trek and having people working on the show like Rick who believed in this type of programming, they even had a chance to shoot part of an episode of Reading Rainbow on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. The whole production always felt like a group effort. Everyone played a role in helping things get done. Whether it was where they can shoot certain on-location segments to planning out what books would be read or talked talked about on the show, and they did so as a team that passionately cared about it all. The show didn't shy away from certain topics either, from the birth of a baby, being the first carefully coordinated birth shown without graphic detail in a kid's program, to how to deal with the death of a loved one, to slavery and the impact it has had on countless lives. Reading Rainbow for me holds a special place in my memories thanks to how it was presented in school. Anytime there was a lesson replaced with the TV cart being wheeled in always created the best moments in class, at least for myself and many of my peers. Much like Bill Nye the Science Guy, getting to watch Reading Rainbow was just a nice way to escape from the mundane norm of what school would bring. I would thrive in my learning endeavors through this medium, and I would have a genuine care for the subject now, rather than feeling like I'm learning because I'm being told to. Here, I actually want to. The show would constantly be recognized for their great efforts in production, winning 26 Emmys throughout its run for excellence in children's programming. But come their Emmy win in 2003, LeVar would go on stage to accept the award and offered one final speech for their 20th anniversary of the program. This might be the last time we're up here. There's no more funding. LeVar, right on TV, said that sadly the show at this point is over. Or at least, it seemed that way. With a 20 year long struggle of getting funding for such a beloved show at this point, their luck in finding said funding was gone. Or so they thought. PBS Kids! PBS Kids.
Because of LeVar's speech, funding for the show came in once again, just by the skin of their teeth, Reading Rainbow was once again saved for a little bit longer. This seemed like a good thing. The show can survive for a bit, but something else just a few years later would be the final page of the book. 2006 would serve as the final year for Reading Rainbow, this time for a different reason, but still due to funds. Why did it go off? No Child Left Behind. The emphasis under No Child Left Behind was on teaching kids how to read and not fostering a love of reading as crazy as that sounds. The No Child Left Behind Act. This affected how certain funds can be used for educational programs, hitting Reading Rainbow through the Corporation for Public Broadcast. It restricted where their funds could and couldn't go. And no matter who you'd hear from in regards to the production of Reading Rainbow, you would see and hear every angle of how this was the break in the structure to keep the show afloat. And for that matter, any show that could fit in a similar category. Teachers all across the country teaching children the test as opposed to instilling in them a love for learning, and that's that's not okay. The focus shifted to programs that taught base aspects of how to rather than teach the want to. And trust me, the crew behind the scenes tried to fight for their right to stay. Twyla always would be on the front lines when it came to making sure funds came in. But when the new guidelines from the act had the Corporation for Public Broadcast only receive and disperse funds to programs that fit a very specific ready-to-learn mold, you had to literally plead your case for existence. But the focus focus of where the funds had to now go shot down any attempts at securing any bit of funding. This shifted how the main house of the broadcast, PBS, had to operate as well, and it seemed like specially selected animation was the new priority. The fight didn't end at the last episode. While 2006 saw the last new episode produced and released, Reading Rainbow would stay in circulation thanks to reruns for roughly three more years until it would disappear completely in 2009. Those three years offered hope that somehow, some way, there could be a path forward to have the show start production back up. But it became clear that this wasn't going to happen, and 2009 closed the book on Reading Rainbow for good. Or maybe it was just closed too early. Because even all this wouldn't compare to what was coming over the next decade plus for Reading Rainbow. The story of the show was about to enter into a new chapter, or rather, a new book entirely. March 19th, 2010. You heard it here first. Reading Rainbow 2.0 is in the works. Stay tuned for more info. This tweet from LeVar Burton would spark some interest online about what this could possibly mean. Heck, there were so many avenues that this could be taken now, if true. And partially, it was. LeVar's company, RR Kids, would finally reach a behind-the-scenes deal with WNED, who still own the rights for Reading Rainbow, as they would then license, keyword to remember being license, out the brand to LeVar's company. This would happen in 2011, leading to a year later in 2012 with a new tweet from LeVar saying, Last day of shooting before launch. This still brought forward questions about what LeVar had planned for the Reading Rainbow brand, with little information given to the public. A few months later in June of 2012, during Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference, the Reading Rainbow app was introduced to the world, presented at the conference by LeVar and his business partner. We have to keep storytelling alive in our culture in order for our culture to survive. I'm here to introduce you to our new Reading Rainbow app. Just a week later, the app would release, and the brand seemed to be back. It's good. It's good, it's man. Reading Rainbow's back. Reading Rainbow is back. What the app offered was probably what you'd expect. It was full of books for audiences under the ages of 10, along with plenty of new videos that would continue the adventurous feeling of the original show in the pursuit of helping kids find the love of reading. LeVar, as well as other celebrities, would be voicing books to present the storytelling and spoken word aspects of the content found there. It really was a segmented version version of Reading Rainbow brought over to the newer modern medium, just like how it was brought to TV when that medium was growing stronger for a younger demographic. Reading will never go out of style, but the tools used for learning are changing. I am excited to bring Reading Rainbow back so that parents who watch the show can now share that same feel-good experience with their own children, but on a platform that resonates with today's digital kids. This was said by LeVar during a special launch in New York City when the app was going live. Only 36 hours after after the app had launched, it was the number one educational app downloaded in the App Store. Things seemed to be going well, at least on the public side of things. The app incentivized kids to keep discovering more stories out there through the books in the app, with a reward system that parents could personally track on a separate standard website that they could connect to their kids' account. There was plenty of content at launch with 150 books and 16 classic-style video field trips, just like the original show, with the promise of more content to be consistently added over time. 
time. LeVar had made many deals through his company to have a large number of children's book publishers be present with their books on the app. Lacking in content for kids to explore was not a problem. This did feature a subscription service, the base version of the app would be free, and you could browse the app completely, but you'd be limited to one book to read. If you wanted the full experience, there were packages that you could pay for for either a month, a half a year, or a full year. As the app was still growing strong, the analytics by the start of 2014 would show that a total of over 10 million books and video field trips were read and viewed by the users. This number would only continue to grow. As this was still going on, we fast forward a couple years to May of 2014, where LeVar wanted to help elevate the brand of Reading Rainbow even further. Wednesday, LeVar started a Kickstarter campaign trying to bring back Reading Rainbow. Launching a Kickstarter campaign to revive the show in general. While the original series would make its way to be used in schools here and there, the mission for this iteration of Reading Rainbow was to have a version of the show that directly was made for the classroom in the efforts to raise up the literacy rates in school, and in doing so, make the series available for schools to use completely free of charge. On the web front, the goal was to create a website that students could access that would continue the original mission statement of Reading Rainbow, with that being helping kids find the love, joy, and passion for reading. But here, it would also serve as a way to actually help kids read, through the core fundamentals of how to do so. The Kickstarter launched on May 28th, 2014. I don't know what to say. We've just crossed the million dollar threshold. 12 hours later, the goal of one million dollars was met. I um, am overwhelmed. 24 hours later, two million dollars had been contributed to the project. By the end of the campaign's run, over 105,000 backers contributed to a massive total of five million four hundred and eight thousand nine hundred and sixteen dollars. It's safe to say the new era of Reading Rainbow was funded, but even then, more money would come in on the side as Seth MacFarlane would donate a lump sum of one million dollars, along with another seventy thousand dollars from direct donors, bringing the total earned to six million four hundred and seventy $78,916. All of this done in just 35 days. At the time, this was the biggest Kickstarter success story seen yet, with the most backers. Mr. Burton, congratulations! Hey, thank you! Obviously, this wasn't the young kid demographic the show would target donating to this, but the adults who grew up with Reading Rainbow wanting to see it return, whether it be of pure nostalgia or wanting the show to reach the current younger generation like it had done to them. Production of this new version of Reading Rainbow would begin, and by May of 2015, a new version, or rather adjacent version, of what existed on the Reading Rainbow app would be brought to the web called Skybrary. Welcome to Skybrary. 500 books, 150 videos, and the same subscription plans that we saw on the app would be there, and it would cover anything under the Reading Rainbow brand, including the Reading Rainbow app. And much like the app, it would feature the setup of these different islands in the sky that would separate the different categories to explore. From here, a version of Skybrary would be in development that was specifically made for schools that could work with teachers and their current curriculum. It was 2016 now, and Reading Rainbow was back, but behind the scenes, a less than pretty picture was being painted. Remember when I said the key word here was license? Well, LeVar Burton was about to be sued, personally. In 2017, WNED filed a lawsuit against LeVar Burton for a myriad of reasons. In fact, before the newly filed lawsuit, WNED had been dealing with LeVar's company RR Kids in court for over a year already. But why would WNED be coming after LeVar's company and him personally? They claimed that the Reading Rainbow brand was being taken over by LeVar and his company. The original license agreement, at least how WNED saw it, was a divide and conquer strategy. RR Kids was supposed to be running the digital distribution side of the show, while WNED would produce new episodes of the show, agreeing on splitting the profits evenly down the middle. WNED felt like that they were losing control of anything to do with the brand that they technically owned thanks to the app, the Kickstarter, Skybrary, and even a regular version of the the show that apparently was in the works between RR Kids and the Jim Henson Company, not disclosing a private deal that they were trying to make with Netflix. This would directly undermine the licensing deal with WNED. 
Now, RR Kids disputed those claims, saying that the discussions with Netflix had nothing to do with Reading Rainbow and were in the efforts of creating a brand new show that would be different in its base concept. Regardless, WNED sent a formal notice of termination to RR Kids. They wanted out of the agreement and to take back control of the brand. The two entities would go back and forth with a federal judge in New York with counterclaims from both sides, as RR Kids would ask the judge to rule in their favor as they claimed to have worked within the rules of the agreement, and the deal couldn't and shouldn't be broken. Any avenue that could be attacked in these legal battles would, with another thing being a podcast that LeVar had started called LeVar Burton Reads. It's like the title says, he would read off short stories on the podcast. But that of course wasn't the problem, it was the use of terminology within it. In the first minute of the first episode, LeVar would say, people have asked me for years and years and years, when are you going to do a reading rainbow for adults? And it's always been something that's on my mind so I wanted to address that. I wanted to address a reading rainbow for adults. Because of those statements in the podcast, the listeners as well as any news outlets reporting on it all referred to it as such, reading rainbow for adults. In WNED's point of view, this would be seen as a direct violation of the licensing agreement, a way to skirt the line of what is considered using the brand. LeVar's counter to this would be, if people are calling it reading rainbow for adults, I can't stop them from that. Regardless of directly saying those words, in the first episode of the podcast, even if he was saying it in a way where it wasn't him directly calling it that. The 2017 lawsuit now was coming for everything. WNED wanted LeVar and RR Kids to release the administrative access and power of the websites, social media accounts, and the YouTube channel all over to them. They also seeked for the addition of LeVar not being allowed to say his Reading Rainbow catchphrase of, but you don't have to take my word for it, on his reading-based podcast. As evidenced by Mr. Burton's conduct since he began teaching teasing the public about the return of Reading Rainbow years before his company acquired any rights to do so, Mr. Burton's goal is to control and reap the benefits of Reading Rainbow's substantial goodwill. Goodwill that unquestionably belongs to WNED. First, defendants tried to assert control over the brand through deception, secret negotiations with Netflix, false accusations of ownership of the RR intellectual property, and misleading efforts to persuade WNED's business associates to make Mr. Burton the host of any new series. Then, defendants tried brute force, the RR Kids action, through which they tied up the RR intellectual property while waging a war of attrition intended to extract a settlement that would loosen restrictions of their ability to exploit the RR intellectual property. Now that WNED has called their bluff and is prepared to take the RR Kids action to trial, defendants have resorted to theft and extortion. As the RR Kids action moved closer to trial, RR Kids began working with Mr. Burton's longtime friend, John Raymonds, to secretly encumber the RR intellectual property as collateral for $2.5 million in loans from Raymond's Capital. These were the scathing remarks from WNED, and all of this, every bit of detail, is meticulously explained and elaborated on further within the 38-page complaint. It is a whirlwind of what WNED claims in this document. From cyber squatting to breach of contract to copyright infringement, just to name a few things that come with a heavy label. Two months later, now being October of 2017, WNED and RR Kids would come to a settlement out of the court system. This means that the majority of the details for how this whole conflict was resolved would be kept private. What we can see are the results of settlements through the agreements they came to. First and foremost, RR Kids no longer held any license to the Reading Rainbow brand. This would also result in RR Kids further distancing themselves from the Reading Rainbow brand by having the company's name changed to LeVar Burton Kids. But there was a silver line somewhat for LeVar personally, as he would be allowed to continue saying his old catchphrase from Reading Rainbow going forward. As this was wrapped up, he would say, all settled, but you don't have to take my word for it, confirming further that it's all good and that he can say it. LeVar would give us further insight to this by saying, there was an amazing outpouring of love and support of fans. It was very heartwarming. I did not make a comment. I was advised not to comment. And as difficult as that was for me, it was nice to have people come to my defense. The Reading Rainbow official website would now offer a timeline history of the show, noting the significant moments in the original show's history and the accomplishments they've achieved adding in some brief details regarding the legal disputes, and that WNED is currently working on the next chapter of Reading Rainbow and will continue its mission of fostering education for a new generation. WNED would go on to receive a 
$100,000 grant in 2018 and began looking into and developing what the next chapter for the Reading Rainbow brand would be. In the end of all this legal drama, there wasn't any ill will towards either side, at least not publicly, as both sides wished each other well with their endeavors. As for anything that once was Reading Rainbow affiliated in terms of the app and the websites, the rebranding would lead to LeVar Burton Kids taking over what had been established, and the app itself now still existing under the name of just Skybrary, thanks to being acquired by the non-profit organization Reading is Fundamental in 2019. With nearly 1,000 books, plenty of video field trips, and the same island-based designs, the spirit of the goal LeVar and his company were aiming for are still there. The final sentiments of LeVar on the whole ordeal would be, WNED and I have settled all of our differences and I wish them well, and I look forward to seeing what they do with the brand next. I was the brand ambassador and the steward for 23 years, and I'm really proud of my time with the brand. At the tail end of 2021, the future of Reading Rainbow would be announced to the world as Reading Rainbow Live, a new version of the show that could be directly interacted with by the viewers, and would feature several different hosts for the program called The Rainbows. On March 6, 2022, this new Reading Rainbow would premiere as a live-streamed online series that follows similar formatting, but now adds on a bonus after show that virtual tickets could be purchased for so that kids can interact directly with the hosts, meet any special guests, and and be more involved in the experience. This choice and direction seem to be a solution for the brand that fit well with kids' education, specifically at a time when the world was a couple years deep into, well, you know. For LeVar and the legacy of what he and so many caring others created with Reading Rainbow, a documentary was made and released in 2022 called Butterfly in the Sky. And at the first ever Children's and Family Emmys in 2022, the National Academy of Arts and Sciences recognized LeVar Burton with a Lifetime Achievement Award, presented by Lawrence Fishburne for all that he's done, and especially for Reading Rainbow, the impact that it had and the legacy that it left. Just watching the nearly 20-minute presentation featuring a sizzle reel of LeVar's work on the show, and all of the testimonies from his fellow Reading Rainbow creators and co-workers, celebrity friends and more, followed up by his acceptance speech, will surely leave you in tears. My dear friend and brother, LeVar Desperton. Sadly, the original Reading Rainbow that I and many others grew up with is long gone, but thanks to it, beautiful memories are created and cherished, and even rewatching them today, so many generations can take away something from it. I am so glad that I got to grow up with the show thanks to it being introduced to me in school, and I think many others from my generation who have had a same or similar experience would feel the same. PBS surveyed schools and teachers over an 18-year period, with the data coming back showing them that Reading Rainbow became the overall most used show to present to kids across the nation. And that's what you get when you take a look. It's in a book. It's Reading Rainbow. But that's our time with Reading Rainbow for today. I hope you were able to either relive some fond memories or learn about something new entirely. Let me know your personal thoughts or any memories about Reading Rainbow in the comments below. Now I guess soon enough we'll need to check in on Miss Frizzle and her class of students, so be prepared to hop on the magic school bus when it comes around to pick you up. As always, I've been Jordan Fringe. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe. Later. Hi, I'm LeVar Burton. Reading rainbow. Reading.